Well, thank you guys so much for being here today. Uh, one of the first things I did when I took office uh, was to request an audit of our state's Medicaid enrollment. It is the largest spend uh, of your state tax dollars. We spend about six billion a year uh, in the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority, and that's uh, primarily Medicaid. And so I really wanted to understand what we'd inherited and, and how those dollars were spent. Uh, so I requested this to make sure uh, that we were being transparent and efficient with the tax dollars uh, and to make sure our resources go to providing quality care to Oklahomans who need it the most. I'm here with State Auditor and Inspector uh, Cindy Bird and Kevin Corbett, the CEO of Oklahoma Healthcare Authority. Uh, Auditor Bird is going to walk you through uh, the details of her report and then we'll come back up and uh, take a few questions. So, uh, Auditor Bird. Thank you, Governor. In March 2019, Governor Stitt requested a performance audit of the Oklahoma Health Care Authority to determine if individuals receiving Medicaid benefits are if they're eligible to be on the rolls. The auditor's office can only conduct a performance audit or a forensic audit for that matter upon request and the governor took an extraordinary step to make that request on the state's largest appropriated state agency. As of June 30th, 2019, approximately 1 million Oklahomans were enrolled in the Medicaid program. Approximately one in four Oklahomans, 25% of our population, are receiving Medicaid assistance. $4.7 billion in claims were paid in services last year. The official eligibility requirements for Oklahoma's Medicaid program are identified in the Health Care Authority's state plan and waiver. The state plan is a written agreement between Oklahoma and the Federal Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, also referred to as CMS. It describes how Oklahoma administers the Medicaid program. The state plan approved by CMS has allowed Oklahoma to do the very minimum concerning eligibility requirements, which has caused uncertainty in the eligibility of the recipients. During our collaborations with other state auditors across the nation, the resonating theme is CMS does not provide strong direction in best practices to administer Medicaid funds. Healthcare authority management has communicated to us that CMS has offered very little guidance on its current operations. And to that point, CMS guidance did not always support federal law and the audit identified where CMS guidance is in direct conflict with federal law. CMS took over all audits regarding eligibility at Healthcare Authority from fiscal years 2013 through 2018 under the Affordable Care Act. Every three years, CMS requires a PERM audit, a payment error rate measurement, to be conducted on the state's Medicaid programs by a third party agency. In the past, there has been very limited feedback from CMS for correction and guidance on these audits until this year. According to Healthcare Authority Management, Oklahoma received the 2018 PERM audit feedback concerning Medicaid eligibility for review year 2019, which covers the 2017-2018 calendar years. And those PERM findings are similar to the findings contained in our audit report. Medicaid is a jointly funded federal state program. Mm -hmm. Medicaid is Oklahoma's largest state appropriated program at $1.2 billion. 3.3 billion was federally funded to Medicaid in Oklahoma in fiscal year 2019. In response to the governor's request, this audit was performed for state fiscal year 2019 to assess whether healthcare authority had sufficient controls in place to assure that only eligible individuals were on the rolls and that those individuals were enrolled and disenrolled in a timely manner. Also that the enrollment followed the state plan and federal laws. If you take a look at this chart, we determined the following for Oklahoma's electronic verification system for Medicaid eligibility. 75% of Oklahoma's recipients' eligibility determination is made through an automated online system at Healthcare Authority. The other 25% is performed manually at the Oklahoma Department of Human Services based on applications submitted. If you take a look at the orange section of this pie chart, 
the 25% of applicants processed through DHS represent 50% of the claims paid during fiscal year 2019, and that's approximately $2.3 billion. DHS is utilizing all data sources available to, the proce to process the Medicaid applicants who qualify for other government assistance programs, like TANF or SNAP, or the aged, blind, or disabled. Therefore, income verification for eligibility determinations for the non-MAGI, again, that's the orange section of this report, the verification determinations were 100% because they were already approved through those other services. In the recommendation section of our report, there are solutions needed at DHS for both case file compliance and consistency. As we transition to these other slides, this orange slide is the process claims at DHS. We're not going to talk about those anymore. Going forward, we're going to talk about the claims processed at the healthcare authority. The blue section of this chart re represents 75% of the, I'm sorry, that was the, the previous chart, we switched slides. This 75% represents um, $2.4 billion and is the focus of the rest of this report. We have simplified the performance audit findings into this chart. It represents the primary concerns found at the healthcare authority during the course of the audit. The red sections identify the most concerning issues that we found. During the audit period, income was not verified for approximately 37% of the Medicaid Assistant Program claims, also referred to as MAP, and 28% of the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP claims, paid on behalf of recipients. So why is this significant? When income is not verified, you have no idea if the recipient is eligible. A lack of safeguards leaves an unknown. Due to incomplete case records of Medicaid, Medicaid recipients at the healthcare authority, we encountered a scope limitation for a projected $845 million in claims paid. This does not mean the claims were paid on behalf of ineligible recipients. It means that we were unable to determine if Medicaid benefits should have been paid on behalf of those recipients. For MAP and CHIP Medicaid recipients, their acceptance is an automated electronic process. Applicants attest online that the information they have provided on their application is true and that they will report any changes, including increases in income, Self-attestation is considered a form of verification according to CMS. The Oklahoma Employment Security Commission is the only source of electronic wage data that healthcare authority uses to verify income. OESC data does not cover these red sections in the, in the pie chart. Income is not verified for individuals who are self-employed, work out of state, work for the federal government, claim zero income, or provide no social security number. So how do we verify income for these individuals? Currently, if you self-attest online for these categories, no additional steps are taken to verify income. Additional steps could be taken to verify income, and Healthcare Authority is currently researching their options for corrective action for these population subsets. Social security numbers or other identifying information are not provided for some non-applicants or their spouses when applying for benefits for their dependents. Therefore, income could not be verified through the OESC data. Now, I want to be clear here that we did not find any problems with non-citizens being determined eligible for Medicaid. We did not find an individual who did not have a social security number who receives Medicaid services. I would also say that any citizen who is applying for Medicaid assistance has a responsibility to justify through supporting documentation their eligibility. Now we're going to look at these blue sections on the chart. For the blue sections, OESC data was used to verify earned income. However, electronic wage data was not being used to verify income as frequently as required. 44% of MAP claims paid and 72% of CHIP claims paid 
may have been paid on behalf of recipients whose income was not checked as often as it should have been. As a result, a projected $29.7 million in claims were paid on behalf of ineligible CHIP recipients. The $29.7 million is both state and federal dollars. This is the only place where we say ineligible recipients because the projection is based on actual errors. Federal law states that an applicant's income must be verified for eligibility at application and one year later at renewal, twice a year, and a requirement to utilize the data as frequently as it's received. OESC updates income data on a quarterly basis. If healthcare authority is receiving income data quarterly, then federal law requires that the information should be used quarterly to determine if a recipient remains eligible. At the point in time when we tested, if healthcare authority had used the updated quarterly data, then the data would have reflected that those individuals were not eligible to receive benefits. Oklahoma is the only state to approve 100% of MAGI applications within 24 hours. Now remember the MAGI applications are those that are proce processed through health care authority. The fact that Oklahoma approves benefits within 24 hours has its pros and cons. We're able to get benefits to people very quickly and we're doing so without verifying income for some recipients. There's a risk built in that some people will receive these benefits who are not entitled to them. Federal regulations allow up to 45 days to determine eligibility prior to certification. Some states utilize the entire 45-day window to determine eligibility and request additional information to prove income, all prior to enrollment. However, CMS would like states to determine eligibility as promptly as possible. It is commendable for health care authority to help the uninsured receive access to health care as soon as possible. And for certain categories of relief, utilizing some additional days to verify the applicant's information would help health care authority oversee that only eligible applicants are receiving these services. I do want it noted that at the time health care authority determines individuals to be in in eligible, they are timely removed from the roles. I want to commend the legislature for passing the HOPE Act in 2017. This places additional requirements on the health care authority to verify eligibility, and I want to recognize the health care authority's efforts to date in implementing the HOPE Act. I believe this, is, this audit is a win for taxpayers and potential Medicaid recipients for several reasons. As I noted previously, the state auditor has no authority to conduct a performance or investigative audit without an authorized request. I commend Governor Stitt for requesting this audit. It's a topic very important to the residents of our state, and it was also the, an audit of the state's largest appropriated uh, agency. It's a review of its practices and an effort to improve the delivery of government services. As a result of this audit request, my office has been able to identify serious concerns in the administration of tax dollars spent on the Medicaid program. A large part of our population received benefits and their income was either not verified or not checked often enough. The governor, my office, and the new CEO of Healthcare Authority are working together to ensure taxpayer funds are spent in the most efficient and effective manner while providing care to the neediest of Oklahomans. And this performance audit serves as a template not only for Oklahoma, but for the nation as a source of information to help design and implement strong internal controls to safeguard tax dollars spent on Medicaid programs in every state. I want to personally thank Melissa Capps, the director of the performance audit in my office with more than 20 years of experience in the state auditor's office and her extraordinary team who worked tirelessly over the past year to complete this audit. Director Corbett, I want to thank you and your team for the extremely nice welcome you had held for us at the Healthcare Authority in conducting this audit and all the assistance you provided to us. Governor Stitt, thank you again for this opportunity. Audits provide a valuable service to improve the accountability and transparency both you and our residents require. Please keep the request coming. Thank you again, uh, Auditor Bird and your team. You guys did a wonderful, wonderful job. 
you know, it, we spin, like I said, it was, it was kind of a no-brainer when you're thinking about getting your arms around state government. You're going to start with the, with the agency that spends the most taxpayer dollars. And this is agency number one. Healthcare authority spends $6 billion. So that's why we requested this audit uh, right off the bat. Uh, but as the auditor mentioned, this audit is the first of its kind in the nation. And another example of how Oklahoma can lead the way on transparency and accountability uh, in state government. Uh, so now that I, we've identified the situation, uh, I have complete confidence in uh, Director Kevin Corbett and his team at uh, the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority uh, to strengthen processes while also ensuring our state resources are being used to provide quality care uh, to the Oklahomans who need it the most. And I've asked uh, uh, Kevin Corbett to come up and uh, give you some comments on what they're doing and, and uh, uh, to ensure that we fix the, any issues. Mr. Corbett. Thank you, Governor. Um, first, um, hats off to you for directing this performance, our first of its kind in the nation, as you mentioned. Uh, also allow me to thank Auditor Byrd and her staff for their professionalism and the collaboration that we received during the conduct of this audit. It was uh, very much appreciated. And as Auditor Byrd said, um, you know, the Medicaid rules are complex, they're significant, and they really, but they do drive our program. And one of those is in the area of eligibility. Quite frankly, it is the foundation and the core of our program to make sure that only eligible individuals are on our rolls. Um, let me say that I have great respect for auditors and the perspectives and the insights they bring. Uh, you know, in the past I was one. Um, and I do find that it's not unusual for auditors to bring forth issues, matters, concerns, some of which is, are significant, because it gives us an opportunity to do something about it. Um, but also the value of an audit really lies in the efforts and the actions we take to respond to it. So let me assure you that as the state's largest funded agency, we are 100% committed to our fiscal responsibility and to maintaining and continuously enhancing our system of controls, which starts with our eligibility system. Uh, in response to this eligibility audit, actions to each finding and recommendation provided by the State Auditor's Office is currently underway. Um, with these actions, we have complete confidence that we will benefit from a stronger set of controls and processes that provide the confidence that only eligible individuals become members of our Medicaid program, while at the same time allowing us to facilitate the quality health care that we do every day for our 800,000 members. Thank you. Governor. Thank you, Director Corbett. We really appreciate you. Uh, we'd like to open it up to a few questions. We've got uh, the auditor here and Director Corbett or myself. Uh, Director Corbett, could you give us more specifics? What specifically are you looking at in terms of uh, what we found these issues and what's the cost that we be associated with that? Yeah, very good question. Um, what Auditor Bird and her team have identified is that there are a number of what I'll call data exchange uh, available sources of information that will help us verify more succinctly and sufficiently income or the lack of income for our members. As Auditor Bird mentioned that we do use some, we're the only state in the, in the nation that does 100% automated verification for our population uh, that we enroll. Uh, there's a number of data sources that we're going to avail ourselves to. Some of it is coming through the HOPE Act that we're implementing. Um, there is a cost to that contract. We have a, a contract underway with the data exchange organization it hopefully be cost neutral because we we st structured it on the basis of a cost savings um, assault along with their compensation that goes with that. That allows us to access uh, debt exchange uh, sources like IRS, tax commission, credit bureaus, and others that will allow us to have, again, more confidence in the verification of income, which could be that there is verification of no income, which is obviously the most vulnerable population that we serve. Four hour window to try to um, prove the beneficiaries or determine if they are eligible. Do you foresee that that time frame will be lengthened because of this audit or um, that you'll take longer to determine if they're eligible? We, we want to 
use every source of information available to ensure that only eligible members uh, are enrolled in our program. And the fact that we have a 40 day, 45 day window to do that is, is one thing that gives us some confidence that we could do that. But at the same time, we want to make sure that every eligible member is enrolled in our program and begins to receive service as quickly as possible. Uh, our eligibility team is looking at how we go about verifying and improving the confidence around eligibility, but at the same time being very timely on benefits provided to our members. Uh, as Auditor Bird said, the majority of the concerns really arise around our system of control, the design of our system that does not provide at this point in time the level of assurance that we all really require and demand. Uh, their audit did identify a few members that were ineligible at the time and have extrapolated that into what that might look like in terms of all members that resembled that. I believe that was $29 million in total cost, both federal and state share. Again, fiscal 19. I mean, there's a possibility that we could we could do some kind of back, you know, retroactive billing or correction. But keep in mind, these are members, potential members that are receiving for service from our providers on the basis that they are members. Where the where the compensation return would come would be from the providers. So we have to balance the service being performed and the the cost that's going to be incurred for that. So. Um, just I read your remarks. Would love to have an email to us. Uh, but what is your your top line takeaway here? Your average Oklahoman tunes into Drillback on News Nine. He gets thirty seconds. What's the top takeaway from this all? Well, taxpayers in Oklahoma want to know that we're spending the money in accordance with the law. All audits are measured in accordance with laws and internal controls. We want to know that no one ineligible was receiving benefits. We have a large population where the income was not verified. Now, we're never going to get that number to zero. There is always going to be a risk there. We just need to get it to a manageable number. And right now, I think if you looked at those pie charts, whenever we you know, had up to 30-something 30, 30 percent that income was never verified, we need to work harder to make sure we're verifying eligibility for those who are being enrolled. The other population where we talked about income not being verified often enough, where we did have or where we did identify errors that were projected, the 29.7 million, we need to use every resource available to us. And I think that that is what Director Corbett plans to do. He plans to get those data systems working with their information so that they can verify eligibility. Thank you. Governor, I have one for you. Um, it, you know, I think that probably you, like us in the media, might have wondered what you were going to find when you uh, did something. And I guess, you know, the worst case scenario would be that you uncovered something really, really problematic. That doesn't sound like that happened. It sounds like you, there's some areas for improvement potentially, is what I'm hearing. How do you grade this? F through A, 1 through 10? Are you, are you happy? Is this good news? What do you think? Well, I, I I think it's really good news that we've got the uh, that we've got the facts out there. That's that's where you want. You just want to get the facts so you can make the right decisions, and then put the team in place to correct any errors. So when we're spending taxpayer dollars, I mean, uh, we, you know, it, it's all relative. But 29 million uh, is a lot of money, and uh, in the grand scheme of things, on a six billion dollar budget, it's not that much money. So. Um, but I, I have a saying that I say at, uh, you know, in the, when I was in the private sector, and I tell it to my team now, it drives them crazy. If it's more than a ham sandwich, uh, we're going to fix it, and we're going to make sure that it's, uh, um, uh, we spend that money correctly. So I have full faith in, uh, in Kevin Corbett and what his team is going to do to make sure they address these processes. We start verifying that income. We take up to 45 days if we need to to get the numbers right. We, we go back and we double check uh, eligibility. Um, at the end of every year. <clears throat> so you've got to, and I don't want, I want Oklahomans to understand also, uh, Medicaid in Oklahoma, we have Medicaid in Oklahoma. Uh, we have 800,000 Oklahomans uh, on this program. And it's the blind, the, the aged, the disabled, the pregnant women, children. Uh, those are all the folks that are covered. And we want to make sure that they continue to be covered and we're good fiscal uh, stewards of these taxpayer dollars. Uh, so so uh, any amount of money that, that is wasted is too much, in my opinion. And uh, that's why we wanted to get this thing done. 
and, uh, and, and get on with the fix of it. One thing I think is interesting about Medicaid in terms of the adult population of the home, I'm going to take this to Tuesday. Uh, you've been vocal that you're not in favor of 802. Uh, it's the, it's the same question. Uh, but we do have, as I think Dr. said, you know, we, we've done the bare minimum of eligibility, right? Uh, other states, California has gotten in trouble for their finances because they have broad programs for adult dental and all those things. But in Oklahoma, you know, I believe it's, what, 37% of FPL if you have a child. Um, so that really equates to like less than $15,100 a year. How, how do we avoid limiting the incentive for people to work more if they're going to lose their health care? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, that's something that uh, we, we've talked a lot about as a staff is, is how do we keep those fiscal cliffs from falling, what, whatever the government assistance is. We want to encourage people to get off these systems and not have just a, uh, um, you know, a fiscal cliff. You know, we're handcuffed uh, a little bit from the federal rules that we have to follow. Uh, but, but that's something that uh, DHS I know is working on and some of the benefits that we provide for Oklahomans uh, to continue to be able to provide stuff as they also increase their earning potential. So I know that Justin Brown is working on that. Uh, I'd need to get into the weeds on, on what we have the potential to do on the, on the Medicaid side as well. Well, one, one eight oh two, that would expand it so that somebody who got a few extra hours at, at their office would take a full-time job or more full-time job. Now keep their health insurance, right? In my opinion, uh, the reason I'm not for 802 is because this doesn't do anything with the 800,000 we already have. We already have Medicaid for the age, blind, the disabled, the pregnant women, all children. You're taking another population, another, another able-bodied uh, group, and we're adding that to the Constitution. So there's two problems with it. Um, we, we, are, we are putting something in our Constitution that handcuffs us for any future change. So as the feds uh, decide to change this program, uh, it's going to obligate uh, Oklahoma taxpayers uh, to continue to fund that. So we estimate it's between $164 million to $200 million cost uh, right now. And um, the only way to pay for that is to reduce services uh, for other agencies, education, transportation, or to raise taxes. That's really the only two options by putting another folks on there. So also, if you put another 200,000, and that's the estimate that would go on uh, the, of the able-bodied folks, now you've got one in four, 25% of our population uh, on, a, on, a, on a Medicaid program. You compare that to other states, Texas has 15% of their population uh, on their Medicaid rolls. Um, also, there's one other, you know, 24 rural hospitals in 16 other states have closed down after they had Medicaid expansion uh, on their on their books. So um, I, I just think there's other ways to expand uh, health access. There's other th other ways to do it than to uh, um, um, you know add the able-bodied working adults on this program. How, how are those ways? And are you pursuing any of them? I know the waiver that you applied for is, I think you was announced that you're not pursuing that right now. Something like that. So you said there's other ways. If, if somebody's looking at ballots and says, well, I'm not sure. I'd love to get a two, but I don't know what those other ways are. Well, the, the, thing, the thing that Oklahomans, in my opinion, need to understand is uh, it's going to cost us between 164 million to $200 million. So where's that money going to come from? We have a structural deficit next year of $954 million. So it's going to be either raising taxes, which I'm not going to be for, or it's going to be cutting services from other state agencies. Because when you put this into the Constitution, the legislature has no uh, other ability but to fund that. So that $164 million has to come from somewhere. So my question is, where is that going to come from? Oklahomans need to understand uh, that it's going to come from cut services elsewhere, whether it's education, transportation, public safety, or it's going to be uh, increased taxes. So that's what Oklahomans need to, need to ask. The, the commercials you know, being run, or it's going to be a billion dollars uh, into the state. Um, it's 800 million from the feds, 200 million from the state, and it's going into uh, it's going to our uh, largest hospitals, basically, for that extra 200 million dollar folks. So uh, I think there's reforms in our delivery method. Uh, we need to look at how we deliver um, health care in Oklahoma. We right now have a fee for service model without any kind of. Um, 
any kind of look to outcome-based. And most other states, I think 41 other states, have an outcome-based model with their Medicaid program where they're holding providers responsible and accountable to the health outcomes of the, of the people versus just a fee-for-service model. So there's a lot of things that we're looking at to actually improve the health outcomes of these 800,000 people before we throw 200,000 back on it. Governor, do you people pay this $200 million amount? Where is that coming from? I know that there's support from the healthcare authority. Of course, COVID's been impacted. Um, I haven't heard any solid estimates or projections from that. So, where is that number coming from? Where's the number coming from? So, uh, the healthcare, yeah, I'll, I'll let Corbin uh, answer that question. Yeah, those are estimates we put together when the governor asked us to submit a state plan amendment to expand. Uh, effective July 1, 20. Um, those, those were adjusted for in the unemployment we were experiencing. Uh, so we are at about 164 million. It was originally about 150. It was originally about 170 members. 170,000 new members would likely come on. There's about another 40 to 50,000 as a result of unemployment as far as the estimates. We can get you all the details on that, but that's how those numbers were. They, those are numbers that we and our consultants used to try to make an estimate as we were providing the, uh, the state plan amendment and the waiver that we filed. I heard the governor said that many times. I'm just trying to figure out where that came from. And Governor, your campaign sent us an email this morning that said, state question eight or two, Medicaid expansion could cost Oklahoma taxpayers up to 374 million. So where, where does the 200 million come from? Where is the 374 million? I'd have to look and see exactly what, uh, read what you're talking about on the 174 million. But basically, uh, however many people you enroll in the program, and, and you were estimating based on our unemployment, it's between 170,000 to 200 and something thousand. Uh, the, the, the state is on the hook for 10% of that right now. The federal, federal government pays 90%. And so that's where he's coming up with $164 million. Um, then there's something called the woodworking, uh, which you might touch on. Um, which I don't really understand. You might you know, touch on the woodworking because that goes up to like 216,000. Yeah, that, that's all included in. I mean, there's the, the those that are currently eligible that have not enrolled could possibly come in. Those are our, on plans that would be eligible that would leave those plans and come into our plan. Um, but yes, that, that's the estimates that we have. The 164 is the best we have today. Um, there is, and that's on the basis of how we were going to expand Medicaid uh, under the governor's plan. Obviously, under 802, there are some circumstances and flexibilities that we're not allowed to. That could impact the, the estimates, if you will. Uh, we have not run those new numbers yet. Uh, we're kind of waiting until what 802 says, and then we'll get back on that. Um, but yeah, that's, those are the best estimates we have today, and it's right around 164. But there's some opportunities, or there's likelihood that those assumptions could be modified. And there's, so we use the number between 164 and $200 million. Governor, uh, I would be remiss for this yeah, sure, absolutely. We're watching that very closely. I have a uh, briefing tonight uh, uh, with the health department, and we'll be doing a uh, we'll be kind of getting together with our team and getting uh, um, you know more in the weeds on the information. But the facts that I do know, you know, we're 63 days into our safely reopening plan, 63 days in. So we knew we were gonna have a little bit of a bump and a, and a spike uh, in the numbers. Um, and I think we had 438 new cases today. One data point that, that uh, uh, I like to remind people is we're the 28th most populated state in the nation. So 28th most populated state. Uh, Arkansas is the 34th most populated state, so a little bit behind us population-wise. Uh, they had 697 uh, cases today. Um, so we're right in line. We're actually lower than most other states. We have actually the 10th fewest cases per capita in the nation and the second fewest cases per capita of any state over 2 million people. So Oklahomans have continued to do a really, really good job uh, you know, on COVID and, and on our response to it. Also, the thing that I, I, I just I just believe in transparency, giving Oklahomans all the data, and that's why we've won a lot of awards by our transparency from the healthcare department. But one thing that is important to uh, uh, for us to all uh, some data points I like Oklahomans to know: forty-seven percent of our cases since we started reopening. So for the last 
63 days, 47% of our new cases have all been 35 years and younger. Okay, uh, that was 3,949 cases. Uh, we had two deaths in that population. That was 0.05% on the under 35 group. 47% of our cases and uh, the death was 0.05%. 70% of our cases were all under the age of 50. 70% of the cases under 50 since we started reopening. And we've had six deaths out of, that was 5,900 cases. So that's a 0.1%. 13% uh, of the cases were 65 and over. Um, and so that is the most vulnerable population. That's what we've said from the very beginning. We have to continue to protect our most vulnerable. We have to be smart about this uh, with washing our hands, continuing uh, with social distancing, making sure that we're smart, we work from home. The most vulnerable population are really the most at, at risk. Uh, but, but we have COVID in, in the U.S. It's still in Oklahoma. We have to learn how to deal with this uh, and how to, how to continue to flatten that curve out. So really, um, it's, it's, we, Oklahomans are doing exactly what we tended to do. In the very beginning, the reason we've issued 25 executive orders was to flatten this curve and make sure we didn't overrun our hospital system. It gave us a chance to build capacity. So we have 5,000 uh, beds available. We have PPE. We've got the strategic stockpile uh, now we're in really good shape there. We're still distributing around to our first responders and our, and our hospitals around the state. So I'm really proud of, of how Oklahomans have handled this. Uh, we, we're in great shape in hospitalizations. I got the number earlier. It was 277. 277 people uh, out of 4 million Oklahomans and out of a capacity of 5,000 across the state of Oklahoma. Uh, so I just want to remind Oklahomans we have to continue to take this seriously. We've got to continue to wash our hands. We've got to continue to uh, stay home if you're, if you're sick and, and specifically the elderly population that are really most vulnerable to this or have an immune compromised systems have got to take extra, extra precaution um, with, with, uh, with, from catching this. Closing down the economy is not part of the discussions at this point. We're so far away from, from, from talking about this. Uh, again, we, we just have to learn how to uh, live with it. We need to continue to monitor that elderly population, the nursing homes. That is the population that I am concerned about and continuing to monitor. Uh, we're continuing to do the cleaning there. Uh, but closing down uh, with 277 people in the hospital, uh, absolutely not. That's not part of the discussion at this point. Um, because the other states that are still you know, closed down or maybe they're in phase one, or uh, they're seeing spikes right now as well. And if you close down, um, you, you, you still are gonna have these ebbs and flows and it, can la it could last for the next two years. We have to learn uh, how to deal with this and how to uh, keep ourselves safe. And I think Oklahomans are doing a really, really good job. I didn't hear the first part of that. Uh, the State Medical Association represents doctors and physicians put out a statement right when your press conference started urging the people, urging you and the Department of Health to require mass use in public and businesses. What is your response to that? You know, I haven't seen, I haven't seen their statement, um, and I wouldn't, I'd be fine with that. I want to encourage people to use masks as well, and uh, um, if you're more, if you, if you are, uh, have a, a vulnerable population. I want you to continue to work from home and, and want us to continue to offer that as businesses and continue to innovate, um, do the deep cleaning. We have to take this seriously. Uh, but shutting, shutting down the economy uh, with 277 people in the hospital with the, with the facts that are in Oklahoma right now uh, is, not, uh, is not something that I think we should do uh, as governor. But, but of course, uh, we, want, we want to encourage people to continue to take personal responsibility in how their health care and how they keep themselves safe. I'm always reluctant to mandate things and, uh, and, and, and mandate uh, different, different things, but because it's about freedom, it's about personal responsibility, and I think, again, Oklahomans do a really, really good job. Uh, we were in Tulsa for President Trump's rally. He mentioned in his speech uh, that you know, he had talked to people about slowing down the testing. And then uh, the next day, some people on his behalf said that that was a joke, kind of a jest. And then he came back the next day after that and said, I don't joke. 
have you talked to him about testing rates and, and do you believe we should be slowing down testing at all or do you think we should continue to keep testing as many folks as possible? No, I think we should continue to test as many folks as possible. Our contact tracing is, uh, is so important for our state. We've tested uh, close to 10% of the population now, so we're between three and 400,000 uh, tested. We're really ramping up our antibody testing as well. Um, but, you know, and we've also, I've, got, I've still got the National Guard on with uh, contact tracers embedded in the health department as we're training more uh, contact tracers. So uh, that's the best way we're going to continue to isolate if they're sick. Uh, but again, it's not practical. This is what Oklahomans realize, and sometimes uh, the media that we watch on television continue to talk about, you know, trying to get the cases to zero. That's just not practical. We have to learn how to live with this, be responsible, keep ourselves safe, um, and, and that's, exactly, that's exactly what I believe uh, we're doing better than any other state here in Oklahoma, and, uh, and I think our data, data proves it. Governor, the health department is encouraging people that went to a, a large gather, gathering like a rally to get tested. Have you and or your staff been tested since the rally? Uh, I have not been tested since the rally. Uh, I got tested um, the day of the rally. I got tested, I think, the day of the rally. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we uh, constantly, I think we're going to have some testing done uh, um, here at the, at the office tomorrow. We've got... Uh, um, We've got 88 test sites set up across the state. We have, uh, we're looking at some rapid testing that we can deploy through kind of the Walgreens around the state. Uh, antibody testing is something that I'm, I'm going to be meeting with the staff tonight to continue to push. I think that's really important data point. Uh, Casey Secretary Shrum just uh, shared with me that our, our, uh, our, our data on people that give blood, we're testing all those for antibodies. We're up to like 6% now in the, in the population of those that are giving blood. Um, so, so we need to continue to do that testing. Um, and uh, I don't know if the team wants me to get tested tomorrow or, uh, or not, but uh, I have no problem. I've been tested uh, three or four times through, since this started. Really? That's something yeah, I have. I, mean, I was just wondering if that was. I have not heard there's any waits at all. Remember, you can call 211, Oklahomans that are listed. We want everybody to get tested. I think yesterday we tested uh, close to 7,000 Oklahomans, and we're continuing to do that all across our providers, our hospitals. We're leaving our 88 uh, mobile sites up. You can call 211 and find a location closest to you. There's also uh, the, the, uh, the company that, that was hired at the Trump rally to do the testing there. Uh, said they can do 20,000 a day. So we're thinking about bringing that into OU and OSU to continue to test the students when they come back. Uh, so we believe testing is really important. I'm going to continue to push that. And, uh, and we want any Oklahoman that, uh, that wants to get tested, we want them to get tested. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.